Hi, welcome back to Northern Exposure. I'm Rick Halpern, a Toronto-based photographer, and joining me today is Michael Jackson, who works out of Los Angeles and joins us today, though, from Buffalo, New York, uh, our hometown. We both grew up there, and in fact, we are related. Michael, over to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you came to photography. Hey, Rick. Thanks so much for uh, letting me be a part of your show. I, I love the one that I saw already. Uh, my name is Michael Lee Jackson, and uh, I am a photographer, among other things. I got into it quite organically. It was, it was one of the things my father started sharing with me uh, at a very young age. And it started with me just enjoying being in the dark room with him and looking at his images. Uh, and he let me help and be a part of the process. And at a pretty young age, threw a Nikon into my crib or maybe not into my crib. I was older than that, but not, not a whole lot, <laughs> you know, and he gave me one of his old Nikons and I, I, I slowly learned how to use it. Uh, I should mention, by the way, my father's name is Bruce Jackson and he's a photographer and professor at the university of Buffalo, uh, who's done probably 40 books or more, many of which are photography based. So he's probably the biggest inspiration in my life, but it was those, early experiences with him that made me fall in love with uh, imagery and and helped me gain an early understanding of the power and importance of it. Great. Well, listen, um, maybe the way to proceed from here is to turn to one of Bruce's photos and let you talk about it. Okay, Michael, do you want to introduce this photo and uh, tell us a little bit about where its power comes from visually Absolutely. And, and, and emotionally. Yeah. For, for me, I, I, I can, I can certainly tell you that it's, it's a, it's a photograph from death row in the Ellis prison farm in Texas in 1979. And th there's so much about this picture that, that blows me away. These, t these two inmates or these two arms that you see there, one in focus, one not playing dominoes. They're in separate cells they're on death row they're waiting to, to die and that's that's how they're they're passing some of their time uh the hallway the symmetry the bars all of the lines uh i find to really be a powerful aspect of this photo that draws me in further as as do i mean the most important part obviously is those arms are attached to people who have been convicted of crimes and who are awaiting their execution. One of the other things that, that blows me away about this picture is it's the kind of picture that, that I might have passed on sharing with people if it were one that I took because the, the arm closest to the viewer is blurry. And I tend to be kind of a perfectionist, but that's not a good thing all the time. This is a, this is a really powerful image, and that would be a terrible reason to, to not share this image. In fact, the motion of it, I think, is important too. But also, it brings up a point about a lot of, a lot of images, and I keep learning this lesson from my father as he's going through his archives of the images he passed on and finding new beauty in them. Uh, or finding the beauty that he never saw, which is these things become important historical documents over time. And, and even with an imperfection uh, that's technical that most people wouldn't care about, they're still important documents and, and they should be shared. And I'm really glad that this one made the cut because it's such a fabulous image. And, uh, and that's, that's another one of the lessons I get when I look at this and I try to carry those to my own work and to look at them with a different kind of critical eye. So I'm really glad you shared that, that image. Um, it, it really is powerful and, and really timeless. You know, um, two brief comments. Um, one on the blurred hand in the, the foreground. This obviously began its life as an analog um, image. Sure and I think did, yeah. one, of the, one of the drawbacks of our shift to digital is we become more perfectionist for two reasons. Because we can. Because yeah. we can, we can always manipulate. Um, and also uh, sharpness becomes a fetish. And I think that that can be a real, a real problem. It's, it it is a problem, yeah. 
The other comment I wanted to make uh, was that some of Bruce Jackson's most enduring work is his uh, photographs on, in Southern prisons, both yeah, indoors and, and actually outdoors. So I'll make yeah. sure when we post this uh, to put a link or two up so that viewers who are unfamiliar uh, with Bruce's photographic work can, can take Great. it. The, the other the other um, the, the other point I wanted to make about that um, before we move on is one of the most important things with that type of photography is something most people might not think of but it's access uh, my father was able to get access to those places because he had he had a, a good body of work already and he was personable and he had the relationships uh, to get in you can't do that anymore. He couldn't get back into those prisons anymore. And very, very few people could because it's gotten so politicized that, uh, that, that the people who work there are afraid of being ambushed. But the access is everything. And, and he and Diane had it for a while and did some really important work down there, uh, both photographically and, and their film called Death Row. Great, thanks for, for contextualizing that. And as I said, we'll put up, we'll put up some links. Great. Uh, you have a, another uh, image that you wanted to talk about, uh, shot by David Yarrow. And yes. uh, why, why don't I turn to that one now? I walked into a restaurant in Montana a while back, and there is a giant print of this image, and I was blown away by it in every respect. So I, I found out it was David Yarrow, who I already follow, uh, uh, and his, his work for National Geographic and otherwise is is really uh, it, I'm super inspired by it because it's just su superb work. This image in particular, I love because of the composition and it's, it's shot in Virginia city, Montana, which is a small town, um, mostly regarded as a ghost town. Uh, but, but there are about 60 residents there in the winter. And again, because of his relationships and his access, uh, and the fact that he shoots there a lot in the winter, he was he was able to coordinate this shot with nobody on the street. Uh, this this bear is a bit of a local celebrity from a local sanctuary, and uh, and he worked with the the guy who mines the bear to to set up this shot. And I love the fact that he shot it from the ground, looking up. The streets are empty. He waited for the snow. All of that requires a ton of planning and patience. It doesn't always go the way you planned. Maybe it doesn't happen on the day you wanted it to. And it's, it's that type of work, it's this type of work that makes me want to work harder uh, I, 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 and not be lazy. And, and sometimes you got to wait for it. Like a lot of the great photographers, you got to wait for it. And so it, it, it speaks to me about composition, patience, relationships and and contemplating everything the planning and it's it's a consummate photograph in that regard i'm, I'm blown away by it well thank you so much for sharing it and uh, maybe a nice segue uh from the work of other photographers uh to your own is to talk a little bit about um montana and how you got there because um, I've been impressed that a lot of your work in the last few years has been uh, the product of what seems to be um, an endless road trip um, <laughs> across, across the United States. And yeah. um, you want to just talk a little bit about the road in photography before we move to your photos? Sure. Uh, this again kind of goes back to my childhood. We used to occasionally pack the family up in a in an RV and drive around the West. And uh, I would look out the window at all the roads we didn't go up. And I knew then that we couldn't do all of them. You know, you would, you never get anywhere. And, and that's why I don't, it takes me so long to get across the country because I drive up every one of those roads now that look interesting to me. And, uh, and I, I'm quite, quite comfortable and quite at home on the road, not knowing uh, what the night's, uh, uh, plans are for where I'm going to put my head down. I just know that it'll always work out and I'll figure it out. And I start thinking about that in the afternoon. Sometimes I make plans. Uh, but it, it, it all started really uh, around, I mean, the constant road tripping around 2013. I had had this hip injury 
that precluded me from my normal routine uh, in Southern California of paddle boarding and climbing up mountains and such. And so I started, I became a weekend warrior and I went out and photographed things. I couldn't walk so well, so I couldn't get so far, but, uh, but that got better. Oh, one of the things that I love so much about driving uh, on particularly on back roads, and I always try to take back roads that do not really see much of America from the interstate. You, you see America from, from the middle of the country on, on farm roads and, and just smaller roads. Every time you see a water tower, you know there's a town. You see a grain elevator, there might be a town also. That town might or might not be inhabited or may or may not be active. And in the Midwest, what I've seen, most of them, I mean, some of those towns are still thriving, but, but, but many of them, their, their better days are gone. And many of them, you'll see the abandoned church uh, and, and the, an old wood grain elevator, train tracks with grass growing over them. And, and when I have time, I'll research those towns at the end of the day. And I take some pictures if, if, if something intrigues me and, and you'll learn about what happened there. And I, I've done it even on the level in Montana. I remember one time from the road, I take the High Line whenever I can. That it's, uh, it's the US2, beautiful drive. Uh, and I went, I saw this farmhouse about a quarter mile off the road and it was a grass driveway. Grass was maybe three or four feet high. And, uh, and I drove through it to get in and, and nobody had been in this place for, I can't even imagine how long, but there were bank records on the floor from the forties and the name. And so I, I never disturb anything when I do this kind of stuff. I, I want to leave everything as I found it. And so I took some photographs of it. And, but that night I researched it and I found out that, you know, the, the, the husband and father of that family had, had passed away. He was a farmer and his wife couldn't keep the farm going. So she sold the house or abandoned it. I can't remember and moved into town and managed the liquor store. And I, I was able to get the whole story and there was still medicine on the counter, um, clothes on the racks. And it, it was, it was haunting to be in there. And, I, I love the stories and I'll tell you one other quick road story. You'll, you'll get a kick out of this last year when I was driving home to set up my show, which is still hanging uh, at the uh, Henry hotel called driving home. Uh, I, I stopped in, I can't remember the name of the town, but it was somewhere within an hour or two of Deadwood in, in North Dakota, I think. And uh, anyway, um, I wish I could remember the name of the town, but it was spectacular. And this, this storm system had followed me all day. Uh, it was partially my fault because I stopped to photograph it. It was so beautiful, but it started to get nasty and I started to get tornado warnings and things like that and giant hail and hearing about the damage to homes and cars and such uh, to the north. So I really put, a, put my foot on the gas and tried to stay ahead of it. And I got to this town, I think it was called Sheridan. Anyway, uh, it was one hotel that looked open and I went in and the woman sitting behind the counter and I say to her, are we all concerned about the tornado? And she said, well, God's going to do what God's going to do. So no. And I said, well, hopefully he's not going to do anything too violent here today. <laughs> I said, is there a saloon nearby? And she said, oh yeah, just up the road. And that's one of my other favorite things to do in non pandemic times is to go to the saloon. Cause that's where, that's where you get, you meet people in town other than the general store or the, the restaurant. And uh, so I went in, somebody saw my license plates from New York. I said, New York, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I must've got lost. And a uh, fairly toothless guy from behind a video game started laughing. And I ended up sitting with, that, with everybody in the bar and, and, uh, and the bartender says to me, no, seriously, how, how, did, how did you get here? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm actually taking back roads from west to east because I want to I want to be able to inform myself about more about the the difference in lives between urban and rural in America and I don't think there's much of a, a connection there and one one's always dictating to the other but to do that without the context of how people live uh, may not get the results that that people intend and uh, she said you're damn right about that that my my niece and nephew, city folk, 
they came to stay with me recently and she said, you know, I pay my kids a dollar for every rabbit they shoot. And, uh, and she said, those things are such pests. They go, they eat my foundation. They go into the sidewalk and they reproduce. Like I said, rabbits, she said, yes. And, uh, obviously I cleaned up my language there for your show. Um, but, uh, but anyway, she said, she said, but they don't understand the guns. They think the killing is gross. And she said, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. And, uh, and the farmer at the end of the bar who was just talking about having lost a few cats, he's like, damn right. And, uh, and so that's the kind of conversation I live for on the road. It's fantastic. So I think that's a really nice uh, setup for us to pivot now and look at some of uh, your photos. Okay. And if you don't mind, I'd like to start with some of the ones uh, shot from the road uh, in the American West, okay? Mm. Okay, Michael, let's start with this photo. Um, do you want to put it in context for us and talk about uh, why you've chosen it? Absolutely, yeah. So I was, I was again, driving back. Uh, I was driving west from uh, Buffalo to Los Angeles a couple of years ago and uh, doing my best to, to take back roads. Uh, it's much easier, by the way, to do a back roads drive across the country if you have somebody helping you navigate. Uh, but sometimes I just get off and off the, off the highway and, and just do my best as long as I'm generally heading in the direction I wanna go in. I don't worry about it too much. Uh, the worst case scenario is I find something cool like Lost Springs, Wyoming population four as of 2018 and uh that that bar on the left is open on on weekends uh and uh and during hunting season i believe uh but i love the the antiques and stuff which is also the post office and there's a sign a little further up the road about the 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 town park uh and i and i drove up the road to the end i didn't see any park i didn't see anything and and part of part of what i what drew me to, to take this picture in this image is it's, it's a couple of buildings which, which make up the town and then it's the abyss after that. And, and there's so many towns uh, that you'll see in the Midwest and the West, particularly in the North uh, that, that look like that. They end either the end of the road just goes into nothing or it goes into the farms. Uh, and, and I just, it just got me thinking about what life must have been like when this this place was more busy. It was probably a place people people stopped at for uh, for supplies, or maybe the railroad came through at one time. Uh, I, I don't remember. It's been a while since I researched it, but that's the kind of stuff I wonder about. And when I was there, I did not see a single person outside. I didn't I didn't get to talk to anybody there. Uh, I think the the image really captures that that desolate feeling, and you're right because the road jogs off to the left, your, your eye goes right to the, the barren. Uh, yeah. There. So it, it, it really is a, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful image. Oh, thank you. Should we look at um, another one shot uh, from the road? Sure. Again, another one of these drives I was heading, I've, I've done the drive in the winter a couple of times and it's, it's spectacular. I mean, what is desolate in, in the summer is, is even more desolate in the winter. Uh, and it, it's just the, the, the life up there, the, the, the elements are so extreme. Uh, the winters are, are brutal. The summers are brutal too. And in just the opposite ways as the winter are, it's winter is it's, it's, it's really a hard, hard life up there. And so on this, on this drive, I had a, a friend with me. And so we were able to navigate a bit on the road and, and we tried to take farm roads as close to the Canadian border as we could for most of the drive. And it was it was spectacular the small towns that that we saw and this is this is one of those things we saw a grain elevator from the road looked like a really beautiful old one and you know thanks to modern technology you can sort of look at look at your handheld and and figure out how to get over there and we did and uh, and what was um, among the things that interested me about about this place is my friend was off to the off to the left uh near near the grain elevator shooting something he thought was interesting and uh and and i saw this car and i was like oh yeah that's that's what interests me about this this shot it, sh it shows so much you've got you've got the tires it's been sitting there for so long that the tires are you know four or five inches into the ground and uh and and you got the the abandoned grain elevator at the back which is now just an enormous birdhouse 
and uh, I just I just loved it and the the melting snow on the ground and uh, I we stayed at that that spot for a while because I found it to be so scenic really really just beautiful old stuff and I believe we were probably trespassing there so uh, I'm always mindful of of you know who might be walking towards me uh, but we didn't we didn't see anybody there just a, a dog nearby barking in a yard What's well, a splendid image and, and thanks a lot for sharing it I, I think uh, it also pairs beautifully with uh, the Lost Springs, uh, Wyoming uh, shot that we started with. Yeah, thanks. So listen, so I'm struck as I, um, as I think about your, your recent work, um, there seems to be a, a contrast um, between some of the black and white, um, which captures desolation, captures it's a sense of like rural archaeology to it, uh -huh. and some of your color landscape work. Um, mm -hmm. sort of celebrates beauty and um, like resurgent spring and I'm yeah just... thank you <laughs> <laughs> how, how do those two how do those two live together how do those two live together how do they coexist yeah um, the the black and white stuff I it's it's not that I I prefer one to the other I think sometimes for example with those two uh, road images you just showed the lost springs uh, and um, and the, the the sunken car, um, the color wouldn't have helped those images at all. It wouldn't have helped tell those stories, in my opinion. Uh, and and by stripping it out and making it um, monochromatic, uh, I think I think the 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 image of what I'm looking at, even though I'm looking at it in color when I take the picture. I think it's just better conveyed that way, and it makes it even more timeless. Uh, and and so, I, I love a lot of stuff in black and white, but certainly not everything. Not not when I'm taking pictures of flowers, for example, uh, and 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 a lot of beautiful landscapes. Well, maybe, uh, maybe with this point, we should pull up one of those um, landscapes. Okay, a absolutely. I, uh, it, I mean, in addition to to documenting, which is. I mean, all, all photography is documenting, uh, but but land, landscape to me is 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 different uh, than than driving uh, and and taking a picture of a of a town. I mean, a lot of landscape stuff you got to work really hard to get there, <laughs> among other, among other differences. Uh, but uh, but this one, the the Carrizo Plain. Uh, this is this is uh, I should say it's it's called the Carrizo Plain National Monument, and it's in Central California. It's the largest natural grassland in California, and this is on on the edge of it in the Temblor Mountains. Uh, and on years when there's a lot of rain in California, there tends to be an extraordinary bloom here in the spring. It's magical and it's utterly temporary. It might last a week. And, and this stuff all looks um, sort of golden and dead the rest of the time. And, but during this, these, you know, week or two uh, every year or longer, if we have a lot of rain, all of a sudden you get these, these shades of, of purple and you get the poppies and orange and diff different orange flowers and the greens and the yellows. And, and it, it's, it's an astonishing place to be immersed in. And, I had been photographing there for years and I never really was able to, to get one of these images that, that, that I loved so much I wanted to put on my wall. Uh, and, and again, I would meet people out there occasionally that were doing such good work. Uh, it made me realize I had to work harder. And so I started exploring the back roads around there and you know, you've gotta be there at sunrise or the light's not gonna be very good and um well sunrise and sunset and and the year that i you know really pushed myself to work harder there uh led me to to this image on one of the the back roads that requires a pretty serious vehicle to get up or down and i was there at, at dawn and uh just dreamy light conditions with the sun rising behind me and clouds still up towards towards the west and, and it was the perfect illumination of, of this bloom at its peak um, about two years ago, I guess. And I've got um, <clears throat> a book ready 
almost ready. I'm finishing it now. It'll be out soon called Super Bloom. And it's about that year at the Carrizo Plain National Monument. And this image is actually a, the cover image for it. And it's on my wall now, by the right, way. I finally right. got one from there. Yeah. Well, wonderful. We'll, we'll all look forward to that, that book coming Thanks. out. Um, so you were mentioning uh, the quality of light. And um, yeah. you shared another photo with me. So uh, I'll first tell you how this image happened. Uh, a friend of mine was working at Yosemite, where, where I took this. Uh, as a volunteer and she said come on up and you know camp at my place you'll you'll love it and so I did and it was her you know her little her little spot was in the valley she stayed in an airstream I put up my tent and uh and it was it was fine until the snow that night turned into rain and it got really wet and so uh she said well come you know come into the airstream I got a little futon you can stay on so I I, I, I laid down on that and it was, it was brutal on my back. It was terrible. It was just, I've been better off sleeping on rocks. And then her, uh, her electricity ran out, uh, her, her fuel cell ran out. And so it was just as cold in there as it was in my tent. And so finally my, you know, with my dog shivering next to me, I said, Oh, the hell with this, we'll get in the car. And we were driving around the Valley. And as the sun started to rise, um, this one beam came out and illuminated this little aspen grove. And it was like there was a spotlight on it with this steam on the ground. And I said, wow, I know that that's not going to be there for more than a minute or two. That's going to that's gonna be gone. That That is utterly momentary. And so jump out and get it or regret it. And uh, I should probably do a t-shirt that says that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so anyway, uh, I did. And, and I got home and, and it wasn't my favorite image from that series that I did that day, that those few days up at Yosemite. But it was the one that several people I really trust, my father included, looked at out of the bunch and said, wow, that's the one. And it turns out that I've sold more of that image than anything else I ever did. Like that, that image really grabs people. And so one of my lessons from that trip was to really pay attention to what what emotionally moves people and 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 we may not necessarily be the best uh critics for our own work uh we may overlook things and so yeah. that's that's how that came about yeah well i'm really glad that you chose that to uh to share this morning i think uh, it, it's a fabulous photo and, and as i said uh along with um the bloom coming uh on on the mountains it really illustrates how this craft is really about light and understanding light and understanding how to use it. So thank you for sharing, but you know, not just these two color uh, photos, but, but everything. Uh, this oh, well, yeah. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to do it. I love it. Yeah, no, this, this, this has been great. Um, look forward to talking to you again and, you know, hopefully post pandemic we'll be able to get together and um, do this in a more uh, human way. <laughs> I look forward I look forward to those days. <laughs> yeah. Many thanks for joining us for another episode of Northern Exposure and stay tuned for future ones which we'll be putting up over the next few weeks. Write to me, let me know what you think. rick.halpern at gmail.com and I'd be particularly interested in hearing from photographers out there who would like to be featured. Take care. <laughs>